This beast, it bears two nuclear reactors with over 60 megawatts of propulsive power driving through anything in its path. What could it be for? Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect, and no, this isn't a nuclear sub, no, it's not a warship. This triumph of propulsion leverages all of that power against an unstoppable enemy, ice. Yeah, you heard me right. Russia drives their biggest icebreakers with twin nuclear reactors. The whole job of an icebreaker is to ram its hull into a solid ice pack and win the fight. If we're going to do that, we need more than just a paddle wheel to achieve it. So let's look at the advanced propulsion of icebreakers. Now, just a quick disclaimer, icebreaking is very much a specialty in the field of ship design. I've done some ice class ships and worked with an Arctic cruise vessel but there's still very much a select group of people that have specialist knowledge. If you happen to run into one of these people, listen to them instead. So it may seem a little reductive, but the first thing we need for icebreaker propulsion is lots of power. Most ships don't come equipped with enough power to drive their bow right up onto land, which is how an icebreaker works. The wedge shaped bow rides up on top of the ice and then the weight of that ship crushes down to break the ice. But this is not an easy task. To achieve this maneuver, uh, the Mackinac, which was an old icebreaker used from 1944 to 2006, she employed 7.5 megawatts, 10,000 horsepower, derived from six diesel engines working together. To give you an idea, this was enough power to supply the city of her namesake two times over. And she's actually kind of small by modern icebreaker standards. Your Arctic class bigger icebreakers go even further. The icebreaker Baltica has over nine megawatts in her hull, but then Russia supersized all of this with their nuclear powered icebreaker. The project 22220 class of icebreakers come with two nuclear reactors delivering a total of 60 megawatts to the propulsion shafts. An icebreaker is essentially a gigantic floating engine set inside the hull of a tank. Pretty cool. But then modern technology came along. We introduced azipods. Azipods are electric motors sitting beneath the hull that drive the ship's propellers. But most importantly, the azipod can rotate the propeller any direction in a 360 degree circle. Now, if you put two or three of these on an icebreaker and have them work together, we introduce a whole new mode of operation, oblique icebreaking. Any icebreaker wants to clear a channel as fast as possible. That's their mission, cut a path through the ice so that freighters and other ships can get through. Except that the freighter following them might be wider than the icebreaker. This will require the icebreaker to make multiple passes through the same channel, widening it. It's a slow and repetitive process that monopolizes the icebreaker. With oblique icebreaking, you don't have to drive straight forward. The azipods will actually hold the ship at an angle and it crabs its way into the ice. Now, since icebreakers are much longer than they are wide, even a slight angle drastically increases the effective width of that channel. Icebreaker is clearing that channel in a single pass, where before it might need three passes. That's a three times increase in productivity, all thanks to azipods. Now this does require a specialized hull. You have to strengthen the sides of your hull and make them even stronger to handle and act as an icebreaking bow. But it's a major advantage if you can make it work. Speaking of increased productivity, did you know that the majority of viewers are not subscribed to this channel? My kittens, they're convinced that this will endanger their kibble supply. 
it greatly decreases their productivity. It has been over five minutes since they did anything cute. So please, they're begging you, subscribe to the channel. Do it for the kittens. Back to ice breaking. Let's talk about the form of power. The Mackinac in her 1944 days had six diesel engines, but these did not connect to the propellers. Instead, each one of these engines were driving DC generators. These DC generators then fed into three DC motors, which drove the propellers. There was no direct link between the engine and the propeller, and we still do this today. But why add all of this complexity? The Mackinac was built in 1944, and back then, we were not using electric motors everywhere. It was difficult to find them for massive applications on ship. Practically every ship had the same answer. Diesel-driven engine directly coupled to the propeller. So why did the Mackinac take on the risk of new electric motors? Well, the benefits outweighed the risks. Despite the risk of this newfangled electric motor, electric propulsion offered abundant benefits for an icebreaker. The first was the engine room layout. When the engines are directly connected to the propeller, we need a straight shaft line between the propeller and the engine. That means your engine's position gets largely dictated by the position of the propeller and that shaft line. For an icebreaker, this gets very problematic. The propeller position places engines low in the hull when they're connected with the shaft line, very low right at the bottom. But icebreakers use especially rounded hulls with very little space near the bottom. If we connected the engines with a straight shaft, it would be very difficult to fit them inside the hull. We liked that flexibility of being able to put our engines anywhere and just connect them with wires. Big wires, but still flexible wires. That flexibility also added a safety feature. Notice that the engines were separated into three pairs, each with their own compartment. There's a watertight bulkhead between each one of those. So if an engine room floods, the other two compartments remain watertight. Their engines are fully operational. You've only lost one third of your power. That makes it extremely unlikely that you're going to completely lose power. And the wiring was set up so that each engine could feed power to any of the electric motors, meaning that you would have to either flood all three engine rooms or completely destroy all three motors if you were going to completely lose propulsion. For anything less than flooding the entire ship, chances are good that you have some combination of engine and electric motor that will still allow you to stay in control. That flexibility to link any engine to any motor also helps with maintenance and efficiency. We don't want to stop the ship if we need to do maintenance on a single engine. Instead, you just run on reduced power, leave that one engine off and use the remaining ones. This is also your strategy for slow steaming. Sometimes the ship doesn't need full power, but these engines, they get extremely inefficient if you try to run them at a low throttle. Instead, completely turn off an engine and leave the remaining beasts running at full power. That flexibility of diesel and electric, it decouples the engineering from the ship operations. That's a huge advantage. Now I can't ignore one of the best benefits for diesel electric propulsion, power decoupling. Diesel engines only develop full power when they're spinning at full speed. If you want more power, the rotation speed goes up. And with a direct mechanical connection, more speed on the engine equals more speed on the propellers. So if we're trying to get full power to ram through a pack of ice, that means our propellers are going to have to be spinning at full speed. And if we're in ice packs with lots of chunks of ice floating underneath the hull, those ice chunks get sucked into the blades of the propeller and it acts like a giant blender. Now that's okay if you're talking little pieces of ice, but for giant heavy ice, the size of a semi truck, yeah, we might want the propellers rotating a little slower to try and prevent damage. So in a conventional connection, your choices are lots of power and risk breaking your prop or little power and you don't really go anywhere. But with diesel electric, we don't need to choose between power or speed. The engines can rotate at full speed to give us all of that power we need. 
but then the electric motor separately, it decides how to use that power. With an electric motor, the power going into it, your torque on the propeller, is not directly linked to the speed. The motor controls the rotating speed and the torque on the propeller. Those are two separate things that are adjusted based upon the resistance on the prop. And all of this is acting independent of your engine speed. So you don't have to choose between rotation speed or power. Diesel electric allows you to pick both on your terms. And here's where we exploit a neat feature of electric motors. Your modern AC electric motor, it actually develops near full torque at its slowest rotation speed. So let's take the worst case scenario where we've got a chunk of ice wedged between the propeller and the hull. That chunk of ice could potentially bring the propeller to a complete stop. With our electric motor, we can bring full torque on at zero RPM and slowly try to wed break our way through that ice. Or let's take this even one step further. Let's say that the ice drifted into our prop, we weren't aware of it, and boom, we suddenly go from full rotation speed to dead stop on our prop. With a direct connection, that's going to suddenly force your engine to stop, which doesn't end well. Bringing an engine to a dead stop in a fraction of a second never goes well. But with diesel electric, that stop scenario only results in tripped circuit breakers. Now, granted, these are very big circuit breakers, but they work on the same principles as your house breakers. They protect all of the electrical circuits. And before I hear it in the comments, yes, there are some mechanical options that can provide the same safety feature, uh, like fluid couplings. But I really like the circuit breakers because they can respond in milliseconds. And then it's very easy to reset those breakers and regain propulsion control. Going back to that idea of using massive torque at low speed to try and break the ice. Diesel electric, it just grants you all of this flexibility and all of these extra safety features and knowledge about your propeller. And that's a really good thing when you're doing ice breaking because surprises might happen with ice breaking and you want to be aware of that and you want the advantage of diesel electric that can react even faster than a human. That's a great safety feature. Now I call this advanced propulsion, but it's just a really interesting problem that they have to solve in icebreakers. You see, it's hard to imagine, but engine cooling actually becomes difficult in ice conditions. Marine engines work different from your car when it comes to cooling. These engines in the boat, they use seawater for cooling. We suck this water in through a special inlet on the hull. We call, this inlet is called a sea chest and it's located on the bottom of the ship, which is why you've never seen it before. But put this in context of ice breaking. What else do we find near the ship's hull on an icebreaker? Yep, giant chunks of ice, and they can get sucked into this sea chest and clog it. Well, a clogged sea chest means no cooling water to the engines. Things are going to overheat pretty quickly. Oh no, what to do? If only we had a steady stream of hot water to melt that ice and keep the sea chest clear. Like say, all of that cooling water that the engine just heated up? Normally, we just pump out that hot water far away from our sea chest. But in the icebreaker, some of that hot water is going to get redirected back into the sea chest. The heat from that hot water melts any ice that's sitting in the sea chest, and it keeps the sea chest operational. Now that's a very efficient use for the waste heat that was generated by our engines, helping everything stay running. A giant engine set in the hull of a tank. That's an icebreaker. Except this tank comes with a few surprises. Azipods allowed the behemoth to pirouette and dance through the ice field. Why, we can even break at an oblique angle, drastically cutting the time needed to clear a channel. And the underlying configuration of diesel electric, that granted us huge redundancy and safety. This was very important when your ship goes around intentionally trying to collide with things. With icebreakers, the propulsion was more than just having a massive power plant. It's having smart power. Thanks very much. I am Nick the Naval Architect. And if you'd like to support this channel, tell a friend about it. Share the good news. Thanks. Oh, did you want more? Because this is what we give away for free. Imagine what you get if you hire us as a marine consultant. Yes!
The primary job of DMS is offering engineering consulting to the maritime industry. If it floats or sinks on purpose, we can help you with it. At DMS, we are here to bring big science and apply them to the smaller vessels, ensuring that everybody gets the maximum potential from their ship.